Well, good morning, Lakeview. Welcome, and good morning to those uh, joining us from around the country. I just saw my cousin Roger online with us. Hey, Roger, it's good to see you, and uh, glad you're joining us this morning. Hope you guys are doing well in Iowa. And uh, before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the closure and what's happening. We've had a lot of emails about uh, when are we opening, when are we going to start worshiping uh, physically again in person. So let me share a little bit of what, about what's happening. We had an email that went out. You should have it from yesterday. Uh, there's also that letter is on the uh, website. And uh, I did a little Facebook thing earlier in the week. So uh, we're getting the word out, but let me just touch on a couple of other things. I want to go back to uh, March. On March 11th, as things were uh, beginning to heat up and we were seeing a lot of uh, uh, cases showing up around the country, uh, Governor Ducey issued uh, an emergency declaration. Now that closed nothing. It opened up the door for uh, some money to be released out of state funds and, and opened the door to apply for some federal funding. So there were no closures yet. March 15th, we had our last in-person worship. And it was after uh, that Sunday morning worship, as I watched the news and was doing some research, I came to the conclusion that we needed to close the office. So I issued an order for our staff uh, not to open on Monday, March 16, and we began to make preparations not to have physical worship the following Sunday. It wasn't until March 17 that uh, Bishop Hoshibata, that following Tuesday, uh, issued a directive to end in-person worship uh, formally and initially and through uh, April 6. The governor's order didn't come out until uh, March 22nd to limit in-person gatherings to 10. And of course, things progressed from there. Um, uh, one of the reasons that uh, we're seeing some pressure now is because people are saying, well, the governor's released his order, so why can't we gather again? So let me ask you a question here. I'm going to come over here and uncover something I have with me. Now, so I have a couple of questions. First of all, do any of you know what this is that I have here? Here, I'll pick it up. Here we go. And then, uh, so, okay, I'm seeing some of you saying, yeah, you know what that is. Now the next question is, how many of you know how to use this? <laughs> well, that's why we're not meeting, because if you know how to use this, you are in the high-risk category. You are the reason that we're being cautious about opening up again and not jumping back into this. Uh, I've been watching the uh, Department of Arizona Health St Statistics very closely. As of Saturday, there have been 799 deaths in Arizona. Now, that's not uh, out of 11 million people, and that's not that many. I mean, it's a lot of people. Uh, but what's significant is 626, or 78% of those, are over age 65. Folks, that's us. Three quarters of the people who have died are over age 65. So even though this may not be as spread as drastically as people anticipated, uh, if you get it and you're over 65, it is impacting people much, much worse. So that's why we're not yet open. I have been watching those uh, statistics. The rates of death seem to be dropping. The uh, hospitalization for COVID-19 has been dropping for a little time now, and new cases are slowing. So I'm cautiously optimistic but we need a bit more time to see what, if any, the effects are from uh, the ending of Governor Ducey's restrictions on May 15th. Our decisions are influenced by our conference directives, but more by our context here in Sun City uh, with your health concerns as my top priority, not by politics. I care little about the whims of <laughs> politicians with self-promoting agendas. When we do begin gathering, though, know that it will be phased in slowly. So uh, we've formed a uh, reconnect team, I'm calling it, 
Uh, and this reconnect team is looking at the process that we will use <clears throat> with adaptions as necessary uh, to uh, reopen and go back, get back to normal. And uh, that team or that plan is forthcoming. Once it's approved and then we get the go ahead, we will uh, implement that plan. So we'll share that with you as soon as it's approved so you'll know what to expect. So in the meantime, I want to encourage you to keep praying for each other. Continue being the church. So I want to remind you that uh, in a little while after the message, we will be sharing in Holy Communion. So invite you to gather the necessary elements and be prepared for that. Also, have your Bible handy so you can refer to it. We'll be working in Acts chapter 1. And wasn't that a great scripture reading? Thank you, Evelyn, for such a great job. And it is an exciting uh, part of God's Word. Connie, thank you for singing as well and sharing your voice. I want to share with you a couple updates on uh, medical things. I received word yesterday that uh, uh, one of our uh, longtime members, Maureen Edwards, uh, passed away yesterday. She had been in hospice for some time, and uh, so keep her uh, family in your prayers. Uh, it was Maureen's husband who uh, made the crosses that we have in our sanctuary that we worship, uh, get to enjoy during worship. So uh, keep them, uh, that's the connection there with the Edwards family. Uh, also received word that uh, Bob Colson fell and broke his hip uh, and is in uh, Boswell Hospital. So keep Bob in your prayers as well. So on this Memorial Day, I'd like to begin with a, a poem by John Greenleaf Whittier. He was a Quaker and an abolitionist during the Civil War. He wrote a, a, a number of poems about the war. And uh, I think this one recounting a particularly deadly day of combat is fitting for us to ponder today as we begin uh, celebrating and as we celebrate uh, Memorial Day today. The poem is titled, The Battle Autumn of 1862 by John Greenleaf Whittier. The flags of war like storm birds fly, the charging trumpets blow, yet no rolls of thunder in the sky, no earthquake strives below, and calm and patient, nature keeps her ancient promise well. <clears throat> Though air o her bloom and greenness sweeps the battle's breath of hell, and still she walks in golden hours through the harvest happy farms, and still she wears her fruits and flowers like jewels on her arms. What mean the gladness of the plain, this joy of eve and morn, the mirth that shakes the beard of grain and yellow locks of corn? Ah, eyes may well be full of tears and hearts with hate are hot, but even paste come round the years and nature changes not. She meets with smiles, our bitter grief with songs, our groans of pain. She mocks with tint of flower and leaf the war field's crimson stain. Still in the cannon's pause, we hear her sweet thanksgiving psalm. Too near to God for doubt or fear, she stares the eternal calm. She knows the seed lies safe below the fires that blast and burn. For all the tears of blood we sow, she waits the rich return. She sees with clearer eye than ours the good of suffering born. The hearts that blossom like her flowers and ripen like her corn. Oh, give to us in times like these the vision of her eyes and make her fields and fruited trees our golden prophecies. Oh, give to us her finer ear above this stormy din we too would hear the bells of cheer ring peace and freedom in. Let's pray. Holy God, we give thanks for uh, the words that reach into our hearts and remind us of the horrors of war. The Lord, we give thanks for those who have sacrificed for freedom, who have sacrificed to free others. Lord, may your comfort bring peace in their family. Lord, may we never forget, lest we repeat the lessons we've learned. 
Lord, we pray for the Marine Edwards family. We pray for uh, Robert and healing for him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless us, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, it's right and fitting for us to lament the cost of war and hate in the world and this high cost of personal loss that it extols on our family and community. So we must remember, or we will be doomed to repeat. Now on that somber note, uh, let us turn to God's word for today. It's not only Memorial Day, but it's Ascension Day, uh, Ascension Sunday. This is the day that we celebrate and particularly poignant this year as we think about this day that Jesus went home Yeah, he's working for home. We've learned what that is like, haven't we? But it's also Aldersgate Sunday for those who are United Methodists and Methodists at heart. We know that this is a a day that we celebrate that uh, John Wesley went to a home on Aldersgate uh, Street in London. And uh, there he uh, was at a present at a Bible study. And one of the men was reading from the introduction to the book of Romans when John's heart was strangely warmed. It was at that time that he, he sensed the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in a real way that transformed his life from that point forward. God works in mysterious ways. So I have a question for you today. Are we a rowboat church or are we a sailboat church? Joan S. Gray in her book, sailboat church explored this notion. Have you ever rowed a rowboat? They're not built for speed unless you happen to be in a rowing hull, but I'm talking rowboat, you know, wide, short, kind of a squatty looking boat, and that you gotta row, those big long oars that are out there. They're not built for speed. On a small pond, they're simply fine, and get one out on the water to fish or perhaps share a romantic float on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. But if you must row very far, you begin to feel the strain on your back and on your shoulders and on your abdomen as you're moving. Your hands may begin to shake as the stress of holding oar handles against the the pressure and the force of the water work against your grip. And if the wind is blowing against you, rowing any distance is very hard work. Now, sailing can be hard work, too, especially on a larger vessel with a lot of sail. Raising, hauling in, jibing, turning can be hard work, but it's usually interspersed with periods of quiet, listening to the water rushing beneath the, the hull and the creak of the lines against block as the wind pushes you along. Ah, it's truly exhilarating to sail before the wind. And when challenges face us like death and budgets, shift in cultures, pandemics, personality conflict, do we as a church depend on our human efforts to work through these challenges? If we do, we're rowing against the wind. We find ourselves rowing harder and harder, frantically trying to make headway, often being pushed back by the force of whatever is pushing against us. Sailboat churches, on the other hand, take in the oars, hoist the sail, and depend upon the Holy Spirit to guide us. We should always be a sailboat church, shouldn't we? But our natural inclination is to break out the oars and try to cut our own path. But we often end up uselessly thrashing the waves, these waters of life, with little headway. You know, every time there's a crisis in the world, I hear people talking about end times. The end times began when Jesus ascended into heaven. But in verse 4, Jesus warns the disciples not to go rushing off with their newfound understanding of the resurrection and the good news of Jesus' forgiving grace, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Wait for the promise of the Father. They were to go Uh, stay in Jerusalem and wait for this gift of the Holy Spirit. They didn't know about that yet. Yeah, but we don't wait very well, do we? 
we haven't waited very well through this whole COVID thing. The disciples respond with the equivalent of, are we there yet? They ask Jesus, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Is this the time? Are you coming now to do this? Get the Romans out. Restore the kingdom. But wait, that's not all, Jesus said. It's not just about Israel and you. It's about all those other people. And you need to go tell them. But don't go without the power of the Holy Spirit. So you need to stay here in Jerusalem and wait a while. And then Jesus was lifted up verse 9, lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. I wonder what that actually looked like. Wouldn't that have been something to see? Is there any wonder that the, the disciples were caught with their mouths agape staring into the sky? And then the angels asked the disciples, why are you standing there looking toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Verse 11, the disciples were looking the wrong way. They were looking up into the sky for Jesus instead of looking into the world where the needs were, where the kingdom of heaven had been born by Jesus' work. Now notice the angels didn't say to, to the disciples, you will see him come, only that he would come in the same way. Back in verse 7, Jesus said, It's not for you to know when the time or the periods that the Father is set by his own authority. Ah, but we're so easily distracted, aren't we? Just exactly when is Jesus coming back? Let's find a code in the Bible. Let's reinterpret Revelation without any cultural context. Let's make up comparisons because surely we're smart enough to figure out and know when Jesus is coming back. The disciples were told not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift, waiting. Okay, so they went back and watched Netflix for 40 days. Waiting is hard work, isn't it? What are we doing while we're waiting? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about waiting. Here's just a few verses about waiting and some things for us to consider. Psalm 25, verse 5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. While we're waiting, we're to be learning, growing, being taught. Then Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. So while we're waiting, we're to take courage. And we need that in this day, don't we? Take courage because, and to be strong, stay faithful, remain on track. Micah 7, verse 7. But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. You know, these times of waiting are times when I think we are more in tune with hearing God if we're, if we're listening. There are times that God is speaking to us. He's always waiting to hear from us, but we need to take time to listen for him. Are you taking time to listen for God? Luke 12, 35 to 36 instructs us to be dressed and ready to keep things, keep the lights burning, be ready for Christ to come back. We need to be anticipating. That means being about the work that he's done. James 5, 7 and 8, be patient like a farmer waits for his crops. Be patient because it strengthens our hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. And then Galatians 5, verse 5. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Our waiting is not idle time. This waiting is a season of active participation in the work of God as we learn and continue to grow as we hear God's voice. While we've been waiting to open doors... God's been busy opening uh, hearts and minds, enabling new avenues of, of witnessing and communication to the world, new tools of carrying the gospel message to people, generations who have been turned away or walked away from the church 
the classic church, God's been working on them. God has been busy teaching us, reminding us that the church is not this building that I'm standing in, but in the people of God out in the world. Now, if you're one of those who has turned away or has walked away from the traditional church, I want you to know that you're worthy of God's love and grace. You don't need my forgiveness. You don't need our approval of this church. Only Jesus. And he's willing and waiting and anxious to give that to you, his love to you. Come to Jesus. Return to him. Give him a chance to show you what he's about and what he's, how much he loves you. On 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah and Elisha are together. Elijah has been teaching Elisha, but Elijah's life is just about over. But before he is swept up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elisha asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Then when Elijah is gone, Elisha picks up Elijah's mantle, this symbol of his prophetic work and ministry, and he carries on with Elijah's work. Jesus has ascended into heaven and given his disciples, you and I, his mantle of authority. That's right. You and I carry that same mantle of authority when we say yes to Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit to carry on this work that Jesus began, this work of building the kingdom of God here on earth, here today, what God has in store tomorrow and when Jesus is come, returning is not our worry. We're called to live here, now, today, within the framework of our culture, your world, your situation. So my prayers for you today is that may you and Lakeview always look in the right direction. Be a sailboat church with the wind of the Holy Spirit driving you into mission, sharing your witness your eyes focused always on the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen.